Hello and welcome to Transparency with Zeb King. Uh, the purpose of our show is to interview local leaders in the region and get a glimpse into their lives and also get a sense of what uh, the political leaders and others, the change makers in the community have to say about various topics and issues. Today we have the honor of having Gary Holman with us on the show. And Gary is a member of the Legislative Assembly uh, for the riding of Saanich North and the Islands. Welcome to Transparency with Zeb King and, and thank you for joining us, Gary. Thanks, Zeb. Um, I should say that at the outset that I'm a municipal councillor with the District of Central Saanich, so sometimes the conversation might come to a municipal topic or a municipal sort of theme. Um, and uh, I guess I'd like to begin by uh, congratulating you, Gary, uh, for, uh, on your marriage to a colleague of mine, Councillor Alicia Cormier, who is now Councillor uh, Alicia Holman. Thanks, Seth. Yeah. And uh, uh, speaking of uh, municipal themes. Right, uh, exactly. I married a, a councillor. So, uh, yeah, our, our challenge, uh, every couple has their challenges. Our challenge is to <laughs> avoid the topic of politics for oh, more than five. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, right, right. And uh, of course, uh, for the viewers, uh, Alicia Holman is a councillor with the District of Central Saanich, right. uh, the same municipal council that I'm on. Uh, so, uh, first question that I'd have is, uh, what is it like to go from being a single politician when you were first elected in 2013 to now having two politicians in the House? <laughs> uh, w well, provincial and local uh, uh, governments are intertwined in many ways, as, as you know. Uh, issues overlap, responsibilities, jurisdictions overlap. Uh, so I, I come from actually from a uh, local, uh, local level of governance. I was the CRD director for Salt Spring, sat on the CRD board representing Salt Spring. Uh, for two terms. They're not a municipality, so they elect a, a regional director and they have the Islands Trust doing the land use planning. So if I come from that background. I think I have a pretty good understanding of how important local governments are in the, uh, you know, our sort of constitutional framework. And uh, my, my view is, uh, I'm a little bit biased, and not just because I'm married to a councillor, but because I come from that background, is I think local governments are not adequately supported. I think they could be uh, much more effective if they were supported more fulsomely, by, in particular by the province, because municipalities are a creature of the provincial government. So sure. I kind of come to provincial politics with that perspective. I think understanding how important local governments can be. And, um, and you came uh, to provincial politics with that perspective before you were married, and now you've got a, a partner who's a, a local politician. And I, is it... Uh, Which just reinforces that view. Right. It, it's just made it even clearer. And, and uh, you know, I do get a snippet here and there, not, mm. not just from Alicia, but uh, from reading the local papers and mm. trying to keep, you know, track of what's going on locally. And, of course, there's three municipalities uh, on the peninsula. But uh, really, it's become even clearer uh, how important that relationship is. And in my view, how it's been somewhat uh, neglected over the years. How, take climate change, for example, climate action. Uh, local governments are at the forefront of that issue, in s both in terms of the potential effects and in terms of what they could do to address climate change. And there's, there are many things I think we should and could be doing to empower local governments to. to to help us tackle that, that issue. That, and that's just one example. Right, right, okay. Uh, before we leave that happy topic of, of marriage, um, I'm, I'm imagining that the two of you met somewhere political, like uh, the Union of BC Municipalities or something. Was it as romantic as that, or <laughs> was it the well, first meeting? And there's, there's nothing more romantic than a UBC. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, uh, no, in fact, uh, I met Alicia the first time as a candidate in 2009 uh, at a chamber event on Salt Spring. And we just happened to be attending the same event and uh, we happened to sit down at the same table. Uh, it w wasn't until uh, the 2013 election actually that we uh, um, 
became a couple. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but our first meeting was uh, at a at a chamber event on on Salt Spring. Myself as a candidate, Alicia at that time I think was working for one of the magazines, and okay. she was I, I believe selling advertising that kind of. She's got that kind of background. Sure, so that yeah. was our first meeting, and I, and it was interesting. Uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce. I'm not a Chamber of Commerce kind of business person. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have that background. Mm -hmm. uh, I come from more of a working family, you know, that kind of thing. But I, it stru Alicia struck me uh, as being, I thought, um, uh, particularly uh, she, had a, she had a broad perspective, which I found quite interesting. Yeah. What would you say is the most difficult thing about being an MLA and being married in terms of, is it, is it such things as um, being on the road all the time, no downtime? What's, what are the struggles of, uh, that people might relate to? Uh, well, I, I guess I'm fortunate in some respects because I'm a, I'm a man of a certain age. Uh, and so my kids have all grown up. Uh, they've uh, they're out of the nest, uh, all doing quite well. Thankfully, they've survived right. my parenthood, uh, <laughs> which I'm quite grateful for. So I I don't have that uh, issue which uh, many politicians have mm -hmm. about uh, having to leave their families behind. And I'm I'm quite fortunate being with Alicia. Uh, I guess our challenge is we're always busy. Uh, mm -hmm. We're always so it's kind of hard to. You know, kind of spend time together and change the the channel. Right, right. So, Gary, I I don't think um, citizens know. Uh, and I might be wrong, but I don't think they know much about you, um, sort of personally. So, I'm hopeful that this interview helps a bit in terms of uh, getting to know Gary Holman. Um, uh, and I know this riding is home to you, and that you live most of your time, I think, on Salt Spring Island. And that situation has changed now, but oh, yeah, I've oh, okay. lived on Salt Spring for 25 years. Um, actually, kind of going back to your mm -hmm. earlier question, uh, probably the biggest challenge for me personally is just the uh, uh, is the public exposure. I'm I'm fairly private by nature, mm -hmm. so I think your comment about people perhaps not knowing much about me personally is I think rings true for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the nature of who I am. Uh, I've come to honor that and not feel, you know, guilty about that, and and uh, I've come to understand that I've got to respect those boundaries that I have around my privacy. So, in some ways, that's been uh, one of the biggest challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, there are so many public events one is expected to attend and should attend mm -hmm. as a public official. Uh, you have to show support for your community, various community groups, fundraising. Uh, uh, events, commemorations, ceremonies. Uh, At the that, same time, do you have to find time for yourself, break away from a few of those? Is that a struggle? Is, uh, well, is it, for me personally, uh, because I've, I've had a fairly long um, uh, life in politics at either the local, for whatever reason, it does seem paradoxical to me that I would be a politician because I'm not by nature, a gregarious person, but I've, I've come to understand the nature of the, of the role. So it's not a, it's not a, a, a huge uh, challenge for me to understand the role I should be playing. Just uh, personally, I do need, from time to time, I need to find a way to break away. And I'm so grateful I, I still have uh, my property on Salt Spring and uh, Alicia, and I do get an opportunity to get away every once in a while. And, Get right. some downtime. That that to me is really the recharging uh, is very important. Important, to me. yeah. And you did mention that I think I think you said that you had two terms. Is it was it two terms as a local politician? Yeah, yeah CRE director for CRE Salt Spring. director for yeah. Salt Spring. Oh, yeah. Right, right. Um, so you're clearly local, and I was wondering, uh, were you also born in the area, or, or and did you raise your family in the area on Salt Spring? Would it be? Uh, I did, uh, yeah. uh, for the most part. A um, little bit of I moved from Victoria to Salt Spring, and my kids uh, uh, came with me on that journey. Oh. I was born in the Fraser Valley, actually, oh. in the Mission in the Fraser Valley, and so my dad was a mill worker. Uh, my mom was uh, a, a, um, a war bride from Glasgow. That's where they met and were married in Britain. Uh, yes. And so my, uh, I went to high school in Mission, 
uh, uh, there in the, in the Fraser Valley, went to UBC, then to Simon Fraser for an MA, and uh, got my first job in Victoria, and, and uh, Victoria, this, this southern island is such an amazing place, we're so lucky to have this place, and it, I think it's one of the, the themes for me that have emerged in my life, is the need to protect and preserve which, by the way, is the motto of the Islands Trust, right? Preserve mm -hmm. and protect. Uh, to protect this very special place, it's something that, that's uh, uh, dear to my heart. But it, it, we're, we're just so lucky to, to have a place like this to live, where you have all the amenities, and you're so close to nature, mm -hmm. surrounded by an incredible marine environment, the Southern Gulf Islands. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's where I came from. So um, I should say to the viewers that we're, uh, we're filming this around the same time that the U.S. election is working its way through. Um, and uh, That's one phrase for it. <laughs> if you've uh, watched the U.S. election, you've seen that the, uh, the candidates, the, the Trump kids and, and as well as the Clintons and their kids and stuff are out on stage and that sort of thing. Um, and you mentioned that you have two children. Um, but you've also mentioned that, that you have you have that private side and that private life. Or do your uh, kids like politics, or do they? Um, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so I have two grown girls and a stepson uh, oh. uh, who's now going to grad school at University of Victoria, taking a um, master's in biology. Um, uh, they're engaged. They're interested. Um, they're not. Um, they're not active per se, and I, I do, while well, they have helped me out um, on, on campaigns, uh, kind of in the background, um, uh, you know, you have to kind of judge what you think uh, they feel comfortable with, and I, I don't like uh, pushing my kids to be, to be out there, and I, yeah, I, I, I think I probably tend to uh, keep them in the background, but I think that's probably their preferences as well. So for me, m my kids being out on stage, um, uh, that's n not something I've necessarily felt that comfortable with. Um, right. But I kind of take their lead as well. Uh, I think I'll know if they want to be more engaged, and I will take advantage of that. But uh, I mean, I am a politician after all. But uh, yeah, I think for the most part, my kids uh, stayed in the background, and I probably prefer it that way. Thank you. Um, so I guess uh, the next question is um, with regards to the election, the previous election. Uh, in 2013, the election result was close for you. Um, I guess you could say it was close for all three. Um, you, you came in first with Stephen Roberts of the Liberal Party, only 163 votes behind you, while Adam Wilson was 379 votes behind you, um, if I got those numbers correct. They, they ring a bell. And uh, so the question is, is the 2016 election essentially a rematch? Uh, do you expect a similar three-way close race uh, or close result? Well, I hope the election's in 2017, unless, ah, sorry, unless yes. I miss something. That's right. Um, uh, I do, actually. Uh, I don't see anything really necessarily that's you know, kind of changed that dynamic. Uh, uh, both of the other candidates are, are have been nominated, and I should say that I'm I'm not yet a candidate. I I intend to run. Um, I expect to be the candidate, but I have to respect the process of our constituency association. Uh, but I do expect to be the candidate in 2017, and I, yeah, I expect it to be another close uh, sort race. of a three-way race in 2017, so. as you as you clarified. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, and, and that was a close uh, race the last time around. Um, while you won in 2013, uh, I, I was looking at the numbers and you, you lost the election in 20, 2009 and actually got more votes than you did in the 2013 election. Right. Um, and so it was actually, I think, about 2,360 fewer votes in 2013 than in the 2009 election. That's quite a uh, change, um, especially when we're thinking of the difference between various candidates of, say, 163, et cetera, but 2,360. Uh, how would you explain 
that shift and where do they go and how do you propose to stop the slide, I guess? <laughs> um, well, uh, it, it seems to me what happened in 2013, uh, I believe the Green candidate pulled votes from both the Liberal and myself. Uh, so if, if, as I recall the numbers, there was a reduction in, in the numbers for both the Liberal and That's the right. NDP candidate. So uh, I, think, I, I think that at least partly explains uh, what, what was uh, happening there. Um, so that, that's, that's my understanding. Uh, I think um, one can perhaps read too much into the tea leaves, but I think uh, on the Liberal side, uh, there was possibly some, well, you know, possibly on both sides, possibly some dissatisfaction with, uh, A, the governing party, which I think is an occupational hazard if you form a government and you're making difficult decisions. That, uh, after a while, I think your, your popularity may wane, depending on the particular circumstances. And, you know, perhaps... Uh, I think the Green Party is, is perhaps seen as something new and fresh and different, um, and, and I think with some justification, so that uh, there seemed to be a, 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 a pulling away from the mainstream parties here in, uh, in the Santa's Peninsula. This, of course, is a pretty unique uh, constituency in writing, uh, with Elizabeth May being the sole Green MP in Canada. And I think Elizabeth has done a good job. I think she's been influential, and I think that probably played a role as well. She was elected in 2011, I believe, uh, first time. So I think her presence also played a role in that, that mm -hmm. result. Uh, how to stem the change? The only way I... I don't think of it in those terms. I, I, the way I think about it is I've been elected to do a job uh, I've worked as hard as I can as an MLA, I've worked as hard as I can to live up to the, the promises I made during the campaign, and that I think is uh, how I try to address that uh, issue that you've raised, is just do as good a job as an MLA as I possibly can, both at the local level and in terms of my uh, critic responsibility at the provincial level, which is democratic reform. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanted to go to something you said previously about uh, that move from the interior, I guess, middle mission area to the islands, and, and uh, you were you were sort of explaining how lucky we are where we live. Um, and I was wondering if you could give me a sense of what your emotional connection to this riding is. What kind of moves you about living here? What about this this area? Uh, I think the ocean is mm -hmm. part of it. Um, uh, I'm not uh, given to uh, astrological uh, interpretations of the world, but I am a Pisces, uh, so uh, I am drawn to the ocean. There is something about the ocean that's always drawn me, um, and uh, I've, I've also felt, always felt pretty strongly about... Um, I own a fairly large property on Salt Spring. I'm lucky enough to purchase there. Uh, 10 acres, actually it's in the ALR, uh, so it's... Uh, uh, do you farm? Or? I, I'm not an active farmer, I do have uh, a tenant who does some okay. farming on the property. Um, so I, I've always been, uh, uh, I've always wanted to own land, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, I think that, that kind of sense of the responsibility of trying to protect that... Uh, but clearly comes, not land in mission. Not land and mission. No. Okay. No. So uh, something about here. Yeah. Well, I, it's a matter of age and, and wherewithal, yeah. and uh, it, it wasn't until a little bit later in sure. life that I was able to afford uh, land, although the, the prices... I bought my property in 1978. I didn't come to live on it full-time until 89. I worked for a consulting economist in White Rock, uh, mm -hmm. Marvin Schaefer, who's a well-known resource economist in British Columbia. So that was just going to be a temporary job for a year or two, and I was going to go back to the land on Salt Spring, and it turned out I was there for nine years. Um, but uh, and and yes, yeah, Salt Spring. You know, uh, I was looking around Southwest British Columbia, kind of traveled, you know, came across to Victoria, went up eastern Vancouver Island, over to uh, um, uh, Thevis, Texada, Powell River, you know, the, the Sunshine Coast. 
uh, and then uh, saw the property on Salt Spring and just kind of, you know, fell in love with it. And that's not an uncommon story for people yeah. who have moved to Salt Spring, or, or here for that matter. I, I just kind of fell in love with the property and, yeah. I've, I've, Sounds like a refuge, uh, uh, a beautiful place. It, it definitely is. Yeah. yeah. It definitely is. And I'm very fortunate to, to have it to, to, uh, to get some occasional respite. Mm. Very good. So, um, back again to the U.S. election, um, uh, to some degree anyway, and we'll skip around. Uh, Bernie Sanders um, has been a phenomenon in the United States, and uh, one of the interesting things is he, he come, had come out and said he is a socialist. Um, the U.K. Labour Party has reaffirmed its support for socialist Jeremy Corbyn, um, Dave Barrett brought in automobile assurance, the ALR, and these were, I think, social democratic principles. Um, and early NDPers like Tommy Douglas were socialists. Uh, where are the socialists today in the NDP? Uh, I, you know, I'm not sure. I don't. Um, I, I tend to look at the world. Uh, I, I hope in a kind of a pragmatic way. I am an economist by background, uh, so I, I, I kind of tend to look at the world as does this make good public policy sense or not? Would you call yourself a socialist? Or? Um, if I if I had to pick a label, I would say I'm a social democrat. But honestly, I I don't you know I don't study the philosophies that much. I'm I'm not necessarily a historian. But I do appreciate the legacies that people like Dave Barrett have left behind. I mean, consider the agricultural land reserve here on the peninsula and what the peninsula would look like if, if uh, that very courageous step had not been taken. Um, but I, t I tend to look at things not so much, am I a socialist, am I a capitalist, but does this make good policy sense? And that can vary depending on the issue that you're talking about. I think one of the areas that um, the NDP, for example, has stayed uh, true to uh, in terms of has been land use planning. I think uh, the agricultural land reserve. Uh, you'll remember the land use planning processes during the 90s, which uh, which doubled parkland in British Columbia. Uh, th that was the Harcourt uh, government that started that, and Glenn Clark, despite his his disparaging comments about Greenpeace, to the contrary. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, actually finished that process. I mean, created the largest protected area network in North America at the time, uh, including the beginnings of the Great Bear Rainforest, which has been a long process and now is, has been completed, and, and credit to the Liberal government for continuing that. But I worked on the Great Bear uh, during when it was a Central Coast LRMP and a North Coast LRMP. Mm -hmm. uh, the last job I did as an economist was on the Central Coast LRMP, and many of the protected areas that are now in place uh, and called the Great Bear uh, Rainforest Protected Area were, were actually designated uh, in 2001 in the late days of the NDP government. But anyway, getting back to your mm. comment, uh, you know, I'm not sure if I'm a socialist. I, I, I definitely am not a, a free market capitalist, absolutely not. But there, you know, there's no economy in the world uh, modern economy in the world, from what I can see, that is a pure capitalist, or we're, we're all mixed economies, including the United States. Uh, there's a large, even there, the, the land of, of capitalism, right, the free market capitalism, still has a large, very large, significant public sector, uh, and, uh, and that's, that's true in British Columbia today. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I uh, I tend not to get engaged in that debate about whether I'm a socialist or, or not. I, I certainly don't apologize for having, for, for believing and espousing that in certain situations, uh, socialism, you know, defined as government owning the means of production, m makes a lot of sense. Medicare is an example, ICBC is an example, uh, BC Ferries uh, is kind of an example, <laughs> uh, used to be a crown corporation. So I, there's lots of examples today where uh, even, you know, you could call this liberal government or right-wing capitalist government. Well, they, they haven't fundamentally 
tampered with uh, with some of those um, uh, socialist legacies left behind by uh, previous um, NDP governments. So that provides, a, I think, a bit of a segue to Kinder Morgan. Um, Gary, I think I've heard, uh, and, and I'd be happy to hear your um, uh, comments on this, a, a criticism of you that that you took uh, a while, it took a long time to come out as opposed uh, to the Kinder Morgan proposal, um, and that the length of time may be attributable to your having to check with the party as to what your position could or should be. Um, how do you answer the criticism that you're beholden to the party structure and unable to take a position until given the okay by party controllers? Uh, so me, it took me personally time to come up with I guess a position on... Perhaps it's uh, with reference to the letter of August um, that's uh, on the website. And I think in the letter it oh, okay. comes out as opposed. Right. Uh, so that letter came as a result of me attending this these, the ministerial panel mm. that was established ostensibly to try and address some of the shortcomings of the review process, uh, the, the NEB review pr process initially undertaken. Um, I, I thought uh, that our party position on Kinder Morgan has been pretty clear ever since Adrian Dix uh, uh, made his famous or infamous uh, commitment during the 2013 election that he, he didn't support it, he didn't think uh, that the, he thought that the risks of the project outweighed the benefits, but the, the single uh, biggest concern was around, uh, well, in fact, at that time, that was even before the process had started. Uh, uh, since then, uh, John Horgan and Spencer Chandler Herbert, who at the time was our environment cr uh, critic, um, uh, wrote a letter to the NEB uh, saying that they couldn't support the project in large part because they didn't feel that the review process was credible. Mm. So that's in writing that was that was stated, and so I never, when, you know, when asked, I will state my view. But uh, I've always um, felt that our party position has been actually pretty clear on that. So, so in terms of the, I mean, the Green Party claims it has a leg up on the, uh, all the other parties in, in, in that it feels it's not whipped, it's not following, I guess, uh, uh, central party uh, directive, uh, and um, so that they can stand up, I guess, as individuals, this is what they would claim, right? Um, and so I'm kind of getting a, uh, into that a bit, a bit as to whether or not you feel that your um, hands are tied in a sense or not. No. No. I do not. Um, now, th you know, there was a point there uh, about, uh, look, we're, we're, a, we're a large caucus, we're not a party of one MLA in the mm. legislature. So as soon as you get more than one MLA, you actually have to confer with your fellow caucus members and come up hopefully with a, a position or, or not. Um, uh, you know, I, I, th I think there's a, a point there uh, about trying to be disciplined in terms of your approach to an issue. If you take a, you know, if you're a nonprofit and you take a position as a board, your board members are expected to support that position, right? Or otherwise you resign from the, the board. The letter that I wrote uh, to, uh, re regarding the, the meeting in Victoria mm -hmm. was, was to make clear, and in fact it was as much a statement of what my understanding of my constituents' views of Kinder Morgan were. Uh, I did not consult John Horgan about that letter. Uh, I wrote it by myself. Uh, I wasn't able to speak uh, at the uh, session in Victoria, uh, along with over a hundred other people. Um, they refused to extend the hearing. Uh, and so uh, I felt that I wanted to speak on behalf of my constituents, take the opportunity to do that. Um, and I simply made clear that based on my, I've knocked on thousands of doors, I've talked to a whole lot of people about Kinder Morgan and other issues, um, any, any feedback I've gotten from my constituents 
uh, has not been supportive of the project, and I wanted to make that clear. And I didn't consult John Horgan about that. I didn't consult John Horgan when I stepped onto Grace Island mm -hmm. and uh, asked the RCMP to enforce laws around uh, burial sites in British Columbia. Right? I didn't ask John Horgan uh, when I um, uh, made a, a very public issue about the Bayside school roof. So it, there, there is a point about uh, caucus taking certain positions and. Uh, you know, you either have to uh, do your best to, uh, you know, support that, and if you feel that, uh, that you can't support it, then you should leave caucus. So, you know, that is an issue that we have to grapple with, the, that perhaps the Green Party with one member in the legislature or one MP in Parliament, uh, it's, it's not a particular issue for them. Uh, you know, the, there's, a, there's a kind of, um, if you take that um, view of the world uh, that the Green Party tends to uh, espouse, that we're individuals, we, we act as individuals, we don't have to confer, and uh, so they're more or less saying, well, we're essentially independents, we don't have a party. Uh, the logical consequence of that is, all right, so here's your, when you run in an election, uh, you put together a platform, which is your commitment to the people of the constituency and the province of British Columbia. This is, if we form government, and that's what we aspire to do, not just complain about government, but actually change it, which is, that's the reason I'm going to run again, it's the reason I ran in the 2009 and then 2013. We aspire to change the channel in this province, and the NDP is the only alternative that can do that. You put together a platform which is your promise to constituents, and your promise to the province that if you elect us, this is, this is what we intend to implement. If we don't implement it, you can judge us by that, for better or for worse. That's our promise to you. So my question, I guess, to uh, the Green Party would be, uh, well, since you're not whipped, since you're not bound by party discipline or a commitment to uh, something other than what you judge yourself as an individual to be the right thing to do at any given moment, well, how do we know we're going to, your, uh, does your platform mean anything? Mm -hmm. there's, there's a logical consequence to that argument about being essentially an independent that I think is, is problematic, in a, particularly in a parliamentary democracy. That uh, you should be, that platform and that discipline to that platform represents your promise to people. Um, I, I do see the other, st I, I do think there's a point that uh, individual MLAs uh, um, they should be able to speak on behalf of their constituents without fear of reprisal, right, from their leader, from their party. Uh, I've tried to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, for example, Steelhead's another interesting mm -hmm. And example. I was actually going to get into that with, with the following question here. Sure. Um, another criticism is that uh, your position, maybe on Steelhead, uh, or, or perhaps it was Kinder Morgan, um, is couched around opposition because First Nations on the peninsula are opposed and not for other reasons. Um, does this mean that if, if that's correct, and uh, maybe it's not, does this mean that you have no other reasons to be opposed to Steelhead's proposal? Um, and if the First Nations were in favor, would you be in favor? Um, Can you give more reasons for your position? Well, uh, there, there's truth to that that in large part I've opposed it because the Wasanich nations on the peninsula have, um, all four of them, have come out in strong opposition. So what I've said is, uh, given that, um, I can't support the project, but if you talk to any of the chiefs representing those First Nations, uh, they are saying that it's not just around, you know, constitutional and treaty rights, it's because we've got grave concerns about mm -hmm. the environmental impacts. We've got grave concerns about safety. How about yourself? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but the you know kind of the bottom, we have uh, we have some we don't oppose LNG development um, by you know in principle. We support responsible resource development. So we've established some conditions around support for LNG projects. One of them is support by First Nations. But it, there's also an environmental condition. There's fair return on uh, fair re return to the owners of the resource, the taxpayers, 
and um, uh, local, local employment. Uh, all of those conditions apply. Uh, none of them were particularly um, addressed by the Steelhead LNG proposal, uh, but certainly the First Nations issue does, does trump uh, everything, but, but their uh, opposition isn't just, you know, it, it's based on a whole number of factors as well, and, 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 uh, and I think they're right. Steelhead, uh, regardless of its uh, commercial merits, which now seem quite dubious given uh, market prices for LNG, um, uh, it's not clear to me at all that they've got uh, supply or the markets lined up, but the location uh, is just um, inappropriate. You couldn't think of a worse location, except possibly Lady Island the Petronas location in Northwest BC, which by the way, uh, the NDP, the three MLAs up there, also came out opposing uh, Petronas as well. Uh, and uh, uh, location, 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 one of the key flaws of our environmental assessment uh, process, and it, it, uh, it, um, it's also true with uh, Shawnigan Lake, the, uh, the toxic wake facility in Shawnigan mm -hmm. Lake. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you need a facility like that, but can you think of a worse place to put a contaminated waste site than in a drinking watershed? So the, there's no pre-screening uh, in the environmental. If we're going to do resource development, then let, let's at least have some kind of process where we're picking sites that uh, in and of themselves minimize impacts, that's not the case with Steelhead. It's not the case with Petronas or the Shawnigan Lake site. And so you're, you're in the soup right away because you're dealing with a site which is by nature inappropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, and the problem there is that the proponents uh, pick the site. Uh, I know I'm going on a little bit uh, well, further afield from your question, but... That's fine. I, I think it's fair to say that there are many, many topics that we could get into, and we haven't even gotten into Indigenous rights and uh, reconciliation with First Nations and and more topics, including uh, schools, and uh, you, you touched on that very briefly. Um, but uh, perhaps we could have you back again in the future. and. Uh, uh, I would like to thank you for coming on our show. Hi, uh, Chikasian. Thank you very much. I'd love to do that. Thanks. Thanks.